Uh, um, thanks very much for everybody for coming. Um, I, I'm up for um, family reasons, so I thought I'd, I'd ask if anybody to do the talk, which was originally meant to be done um, at the book fair last year, but due to technical problems, um, didn't happen. So, um, for the life of Peter Kapotkin, um, from the past commune to the Constrat Rebellion. Um, I'm Ian Mackay. Um, I'm editor of Black Flag Anarchist Review, or one of the editors, I should say, and www.blackflag.org.uk, author of an anarchist FAQ, www.anarchistfaq.org, and editor of the complete um, French edition of, English translation of the 1913 French edition of Kropotkin's last book he published in his lifetime, which was Modern Science and Anarchy. Um, also, The Direct Struggle Against Capital, uh, Peter Kropotkin Anthology, and out last year was The Rebel, um, which was Kropotkin's first book, um, published in 1885. So, the first book and the last book and the bit in the middle. So, um, I know a bit about Kropotkin. Um, from Prince of Revolution, I guess that most people know that he was a prince. He was Prince Peter Kropotkin. He was um, a member of the Russian aristocracy. Um, he got, um, but he is most famous, obviously, for being the, the leading advocate of anarcho-communism in the world at, at the time. And world-renowned scientist as well, a leading geographer. Um, he was, um, yeah, he was a man of science, and that was his first passion. Um, but, and. As a scientist, he contributed a great many articles to the 11th edition of Encyclopedia Britannica. Not only um, the most famous one, which is obviously the entry on anarchism, which has been republished as a pamphlet many, many times, but also um, fast waves of articles about Russian geography. So he was the go-to guy for, um, for the geographical um, work um, on the Asian continent. And that's where he made his name as a scientist. He also wrote books on a host of subjects, anarchism, of course, history and the labour and the socialist movements, history, the Great French Revolution, um, the rise of the state, technology and industrial change, um, evolution, the importance of cooperation and the origins of ethics, um, Russian literature and developments in science, the latter being um, what was his main source of income because he thought, as a socialist, you have to work for a living and you can't live off, say, you know, the, the surplus value extracted from your proletarians in your factories, naming no names, um, or otherwise, um, you know, you basically have to earn a living and he earned his living by doing um, scientific um, articles for various journals. So, essentially we've got a 50 year period, 1871 to 1921, and he was an anarchist from 1872 until his death in February 1921, and these Two key events bracketed his life essentially. There was a past commune of March to 18th of March to the 28th of May 1871, um, which expressed many libertarian ideas and played a key role in Kropotkin's anarchism. And the Constrat uprising from the 1st of March to the 18th of March 1921, uh, which confirmed the anarchist critique of Marxism. So, um, two key events, two key communes, two key uprisings, and um, both played. Um, Obviously, the past common period an immense part in the development of anarchism and particularly Kropotkin's politics, but the Constrat Rebellion confirmed um, the anarchist critique of Marxism, an equally important event. Mm. So, a few myths, um, and I'm going to sort of go through some of them. Um, there's the notion that um, Kropotkin and other anarcho communists think that you'll get utopia the day after the revolution, which is just nonsense. It means it's silly, anybody even suggested that. Um, but he envisioned small autonomous communities devoted to small scale production, looking backwards for change. Um, if you read what he actually wrote, he said no such thing. He, he was an advocate of appropriate, tech, appropriate levels of technology. And he was well aware that um, you can't build you know, ocean liners in a village. Um, and if you look at what he actually wrote, it was all to do with appropriate levels of technology. There's, um, but my, my favourite one, I think, is the world-famous geographer and gentle anarchist theoretician of non-violence, um, which is Carl, Carolyn Ashbo in an absolutely terrible book about Lucy Parsons, where she maintains that she wasn't an anarchist and that the Haymarket Martyrs weren't anarchists and that Kropotkin was a pacifist, which he wasn't. He really wasn't. Anybody who suggests that he was has never read anything by Kropotkin. And finally, um, 
Moss Brinton, who, who is otherwise a very sound libertarian socialist um, associated with solidarity in the 60s and 70s. But he was basically had the opinion that he advocated class cooperation and that was not an advocate of class struggle, which again is nonsense. Kropotkin was. He was a revolutionary class struggle anarchist. He was not an arco Santa. Um, he was an important and relevant revolutionary finger, thinker. Um, he had his flaws, um, but he is not the sort of, you know, stick a, stick a Santa hat on him and because he advocates giving out free stuff at Christmas. He wasn't that sort of guy at all. And the fact he's somehow mutated into that is quite strange, really, considering his actual politics. So anarchism before Kropotkin. So two key think thinkers, um, Proudhon and Bakunin, and Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, the first person to call himself an anarchist in what's property in 1840. Um, he laid the foundations of anarchism, opposition to property, you know, capitalism, property is theft, opposition to the state, and argued that it was inevitably changed to capital when directed against the proletariat, can't be used for social reform, um, advocated workers' self-management and production, socialisation and federalism, and while he played an active part in the 1848 French Revolution, he was essentially a reformist, a mutualist. Uh, but he laid a lot of the foundations of what we consider to be anarchism. And if you're interested, I did a Proudhon anthology called Property is Theft, available from all good bookshops. Um, so the next key event is the International Workers Association, or International Working Men's Association, as it was called at the time, and founded by British trade unionists and French mutualists but not Karl Marx. If anybody says that Karl Marx founded the First International, you have my permission to slap them repeatedly about the head with a fish because he turned up on the day and just happened to be walking past and one of his colleagues said, oh, there's this thing going on in, you know, in Holborn, you should go along. And that's, his, that's the only thing he did <laughs> in terms of the First International was turn up on the day. Um, so anyway. Within the mutualist ranks arose revolutionary collectivism, um, which is sort of syndicalist in nature. And that is mostly associated with Michael Bakunin, who was, again, a Russian nobleman, um, but originally a Slavic Republican, um, pan-Slav nationalist, but became an anarchist in the last 10 years of his life, championed collectivism within the First International, and helping to make it anarchist. And he laid the foundation of revolutionary anarchism at St. Emir Congress in 1872. And so both of those people um, were very influential in the rise of anarchism. And that's what Kropotkin came across when he came to the West um, in 1872. So Kropotkin before anarchism. Um, as I said, he was a Russian aristocrat born into the um, aristocracy. His father was a serf owner. Um, influenced by his tutor, a French Republican, and he became a liberal reformer. Um, he's 14, he enrolled in the Corps of Pages at, in St. Petersburg and became a page to the Tsar, Alexander II, and saw the failings of the regime f at first hand. When he graduated, he was the top of his class, and that, allowed, that meant he could pick any, any regiment to join. So he joined the Cossack Regiment in Siberia because he wanted to explore, because science was his great love. And he took part in geographical expeditions, tried and failed to reform the local Tsarist state and bureaucracy. Um, saw the inertia, the ignorance, and the power of a bureaucracy at first hand. Very important in terms of his subsequent political development. There he met in Siberia various radical exiles, read Proudhon's um, System of Economic Contradictions, became a socialist. In 1867, he resigned his commission and entered the St. Petersburg Imperial University, and he became the, the, the secretary of the geography section of the Russian Geographical Society. Took a keen interest in developments in Western Europe, particularly the International Workers' Association and the Paris Commune. And in 1871, while exploring glacial deposits in Finland, he basically he had a choice. He said, like, you know, either I pursue science, which I love, um, or I tried to change the world, and he didn't think it was fair, but he should get a life of science when the working masses were being oppressed and exploited, and they could not enjoy the, the love of science. And he talks about this in his um, memoirs, and he decided to become a socialist. <clears throat> Paris Commune, um, as I mentioned, is a key event. Paris was being besieged during the Franco-Prussian War. The defeat of France in that war saw um, the Third Republic proclaimed. Um, 
the government tried to take a cannon from the Paris National Guard on one March. And in case you're wondering why um, there's a bloody big church on the top of that hill in Mont March, Sakakura, but it's to atone for the sins of the commune because that's where it started. And that's where the cannons were. And that's when the government tried to take it apart. Basically, people went up and said, um, fraternalised with them, and they refused to shoot. And instead, they turned their guns on the officers. And the commune um, happened as a result. Basically, the, um, the national government legged it. They saw what was going on, saw a lot of angry people with guns and cannons and legged it to Versailles. And in the fire vacuum that happened, the municipal council was elected, proclaimed its federalist autonomy, and its very famous declaration to the French people um, was written by a prudenist and, and expounded a, f a vision of France as a federation of communes, which was advocated by Proudhon in the years before his death in 1865. Terrified the, the bourgeoisie, but actually very minor economic reforms were implemented. They, they didn't do very much. Um, however, it was crushed by the past state, tens of thousands killed by the army, and both um, Bakunin and Marx championed it as an example of um, you know, a social revolution. Um, and for Bakunin, it was a, clear, a bold and clearly formulated negation of the state as federalism. Marx, you know, the civil war in France, made other comments in his reporting. But for the anarchist movement, it was a key event. So in 1872, this is a key day for Kropotkin, key year for Kropotkin, that's when he went on a scientific trip to Western Europe. He went to Switzerland, he met the radicals, he wanted to meet the International Workers Association, the people associated with that. He met both branches of the IWA. He met the official Marx-approved branch, who are basically um, working with um, the liberals, bourgeois, undermining strikes to get um, the sort of liberals elected into the local council, really a bunch of um, reformist prats, um, and basically Kapotin was completely disgusted by them, by their opportunism, by their disdain for the, the masses, by their willingness to sacrifice the workers' economic struggle for a few minor gains in terms of getting some liberal hoisted into a local council. He was impressed by the Jura Federation, which was the leading organisation in the Federalist Wing of the International, and he didn't notice the separation between the leaders and the workers didn't exist in the Jura. Everybody was equal. Everybody was no, nobody was like nobody treated Bakunin any different than anybody else. And he was very impressed by the um, by everybody involved and the, the culture and the atmosphere. And within the Jura Federation, he he, he talked about anarchism with. Um, James Gilmayan and other members of the Federation and the criticism of state socialism um, and the revolutionary agitation. They were arguing for basically um, what would be called syndicalism now, direct struggle against capital, unions, um, strikes, that sort of thing, rather than election electioneering. And after discussing it with, uh, with everybody and seeing both sides of the organisation, he'd made his mind up. He became an anarchist. <clears throat> So he returned to France and he joined with the populists, um, with sort of the go to the people uh, movement. Um, the Chignovsky, I'm not going to pronounce that, somebody else can do that. Um, and basically advocated Federalist wing politics within the, the populist movement, arguing for importance to be, um, no, it was a big debate at the time. Um, do you work within the um, student circles or do you go to the people? Do you go to the workers? Do you go to the peasants? He was very much in favour of going to the workers and going to the peasants. And basically it could never work unless it was um, an insurrection. It could only work if you had mass support, obviously. Um, and he should not stand outside the people, but amongst them, encouraging the revolt, to the spirit of revolt, as he later called it. And, and it's very much a key, that's his, that was what he argued throughout his time as an anarchist when he got back, but as I'll explain later. His idea is he was populating and popularising and advocating in this populist movement in Russia was also um, what he would argue in the anarchist movement um, when, he, when he returned to um, Western Europe. He was arrested and imprisoned in 1874 um, because his disguise of wearing a peasant smock didn't fool the secret police. Uh, uh, but he did escape from a prison hospital um, a couple of years later. Some people would say he escaped from you know, the Peter and Paul prison. He didn't. He escaped from the hospital. He came down with, um, with the flu, influenza, um, and when he was in the hospital wing, they did break him out. 
he didn't, he, it wasn't a massive escape from prison, it was the hospital wing. An impressive feat in and of itself, though, but, you know, um, and it was just sort of, you know, so broke him out. He went into exile, um, and the first place he landed in was, was Scotland, actually. And, um, and he discovered talking to his, um, to, to the woman who was sort of um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the hotel he was, he, ca he, he came to the conclusion that, um, you know, sort of being able to like, um, you know, sort of think he can re say, you know, speak English and talk to somebody in English are two very different things. And he's just sort of, sort of getting a grasp of the, uh, the intricacies of English as a spoken language, particularly in Scotland, I'm sure. Um, it was a bit of a bit of amusing, amusing time for him. Um, but he went into exile, eventually moved back to Switzerland, joined the Federalist Wing, the Jura Federation again, and took a leading role and helped establish the Revolte, the rebel, in 1879, which became um, by far the most successful um, French anarchist paper of the time. Um, the, the, the one that, the, before that, Proudhon's papers during the 1848 revolution were the, the most populous, um, but Le Revolte um, was basically a, a smash hit and um, was very popular, selling thousands of issues compared to a couple hundred of the previous ones. Um, he championed the, the already started move from anarchist collectivism, which is um, distribution according to labour, according to deed, to communism, um, as in distribution according to deed from each according to abilities to each according to their um, needs. It should be stressed that Kropotkin didn't invent um, common anarchism. It was originally raised in the Italian sections of the First International in 1876, and a lot of the work had already started when he was still in prison in Russia. Um, and by the time he came back to Western Europe, he, um, he basically championed a, a, the move that was already going on. He was arrested in France in 1882 and imprisoned in 1883 after the Lyon show trial. Was it gone? It's, ah, okay. So, his first book, published in 1885, which is just, just out with a new translation um, last year, it was a rebel. And this was edited by Elise Reclus, another well-known um, scientist and our internationally renowned geographer, actually, uh, when Kropotkin was in jail, made up mostly of articles of revolt of, Re of from the revolte, hence Woods of the Rebel. And basically, um, it's trying. He tried to basically push the idea of being hope, not despair, which pushes a revolution. Trying to point to the positive examples that was going on to encourage um, what. As as the as one of the chapters is called the spirit of revolt, to give basically the idea that change is possible, and he was very much against the idea of sort of, well, capitalism is really horrible. Um, you know, it's, it's so miserable. He he tried to count, counteract that by saying yes, things are bad, but let's look at the positive side. Let's think about what can inspire people to change things rather than just moaning about stuff. And that's a very key part of his politics. He considered that the critical part of his anarchism, so he was talking about the state, law and authority, revolution, the government, war and so forth, and such aspects of continual issues to do with you know, revolutionary politics, the role of minorities, political rights, um, how to encourage revolt, um, lessons of the past commune. So it's quite an important book and it ends on expropriation, which was the articles he started writing just before he got arrested in 1882. And that is the key thing. He, he tried to define what was required for a social revolution to succeed. And he argued that expropriation, seizing the means of production, seizing housing and so forth, turning it into common property was the way to do it. And it should be pointed out that even then in his earliest work, he's still thinking of a whole period of like three, four or five years before we're even talking about the possibility of an actual revolution. It'd be a revolutionary period where sort of things would build up and more and more people would revolt, more and more struggles would go on until you've got a situation when you've, you are going to be um, in a position to actually expropriate capital and all over. So even now, even here, like the notion there's going to be like an overnight revolution is missing um, from that work. He's actually saying the exact opposite. Hmm. There is one um, thing to do with was a rebel, which I think is, I should note this, but it doesn't really mention uh, much about um, how we get to, to a revolutionary situation, and that's a lacking. Um, he was writing about anarchist involvement in the labour movement 
in Laravolte and in the new edition um, I've included um, in supplementary material stuff about the labour movement to get an idea of how you saw um, a social revolution developing. Um, but it is a, a very important work and it's, and basically it's his first book in, English, in French, first, for the first like, anarchist book, and it was the last to be translated into English. It only appeared in a nearly complete edition in like 19, 1992. So, I mean, parts of it had been translated, but the whole thing had never been translated, which is quite, quite sh surprising, really. His next major work is The Conquest of Bread, 1892. So he was released from prison in 1886, went to Britain, helped found freedom, which is still going, more or less, two issues a year. Um, also started again writing for Revolte, continuing with expropriation. Various articles were collected again by um, Elise Reculeau, um, in 19, 1892 and published as The Conquest of Bread. And this is a constructive part of the anarchist common society, trying to predict as far as possible what, 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 how it would work, what would be a revolution would be like, what would an anarchist society be like. Essentially a sketch of what a past commune should have done. Again, expropriation is a key theme and the need to secure an economic basis for the revolts and contains the best arguments for communism, the wages system, um, the chapter, that is still the best arguments I've read for communism and predicted how state communism is doomed to failure. And it predicts an ideal case. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously Kapot can recognise that no actual revolution would follow exactly this path. He was just trying to give an example of what, the, you, know, what you should be aiming for. And he says, like, you know, this is what he said in, 1990, in 1921, 19, 1911. Um, never to forget, the offer does not offer us anything unchangeable, anything decreed in advance. Life is infinitely more complicated than anything that can be foreseen. So while he was trying to sort of point people in the right way, he was very clear that um, these are just suggestions and any real evolution would never quite be the same. So it's an ideal case, but it's to get you to think. And that's the key thing, to think about how you would actually go around creating an anarchist society, and that's important. And as I said, encouraging spirit of revolt. The books, both those books suffer from a lack of discussion of means, and these are going to be found in the articles he wrote for the anarchist press in France and in Britain. And as Kapotzen said, these were more expressive of my anarchist ideas. And if you would not, um, so he was kind of aware there was a missing volume um, of He's got the one that's like a critique of capitalism and the state, and you've got, this is what we're going to do to replace it, but how do we get, what's the join between these two? So he's quite aware that there was something missing, but he never got around to doing this, and he did think it would be a good idea to do this selection. And Direct Struggle Against Capital includes many of these articles, and the new edition of Words of a Rebel includes the articles he was writing on the labour movement between 1879 and 1882. And as a good pecunist, for want of a better word, he advocated a syndicate strategy, but also recognised the need for an anarchist party, for anarchists to organise together as anarchists to influence the class struggle. And he was always stressing, a social, a social revolution cannot be the work of individuals, it has to be the work of the masses. His next major book is Fields, Factories and Workshops, which was published in 1898. Um, key idea in that is integration rather than division. Um, Adam Smith, as famously in the, the Wealth of Nations, talked about the importance of the division of labour, division of um, also the division of like nations into agricultural nations and industrial nations, and the whole sort of context of um, bourgeois political economy. And Kapotkin can argued against that, but rather for integration, industry and agriculture, manual work and brain work. The spread of industry across the globe. No nation specialises just in agriculture or just in industry. He predicted that industry would spread and each nation would become an industrial nation and a food producing nation. And he also argued for the continued existence and growth of small scale industry. He was completely against, and he proved it with statistics, and the notion of increasing the capital, um, big, big industry, out destroying small industry, never quite happened. Big industry does exist. However, small industries still, floss, still flourish. And he was, and he's basically argued that um, you have to take that into mind, and that, and that happens for good reasons. And so this is not as small as beautiful as such, but appropriate levels of technology, as I've said. Um, you know, great ironworks and mining enterprises, you know, 
ocean steamers cannot be built in village factories. So he was very much aware that it would be appropriate levels of technology and it would vary considerably depending on the objective needs of production. Local production is prioritised, but not the be all or the end all. And he actually says, you know, if you do go the down this route of um, sort of embracing the, the implication of integration, um, the actual material being circulated around the world might actually increase, but it would only be what was actually needed to be circulated rather than like apples coming from South Africa, for example, and other stupidities like that. And obviously he was predicting that this was a tendency, but he was well aware that capitalism is a, it's an economic structure marked by power, marked by hierarchy, marked by the needs for profit and so forth. And so it was a tendency. And as long as it's organised in a capital, capitalist manner, then the changes he was predicting would never completely flourish. He was well aware that well, these was a, well, this was a tendency within capitalism, it would never fully flourish until he got rid of capitalism completely. And then you would get a fully integrated society where people would work with their hands and with their minds and factories and fields. And the world would be structured in a way for human needs, um, both, as, both as consumption and as, product, as, and, as as, and as producers, and also as from an ecological point of view. This next book in 1902 is Mutual Aid, probably his most famous work. And it's basically, the, and all you really need to know about Mutual Aid is a subtitle, A Factor of Evolution. He never said or never denied that there was competition, individual or between species. He said that Mutual Aid was a factor and the other one was competition. And he was well aware that um, he did not deny selfishness, he did not deny competition or class struggle. Um, and he was well aware that man is, is a result of both his inherited instincts and his education. So the nature-nurture argument. And he was well aware that certain, um, certain environments would produce more cooperative people than other environments. And the aim was to change the environment to make sure their cooperative tendencies came to the fore. He has a Darwinian um, perspective. Anybody that says Kropotkin wasn't a Darwinian hasn't read Kropotkin. He was very, he's, Kropotkin quotes Darwin and particularly the Dissent of Man. And so he is basing himself on the leading edge evolutionary theories of his time. He was not denying Darwin. He was basically, and he was quoting Darwin to show that Darwin himself was aware of the importance of cooperation. Um, Mature should not be confused with altruism of what is the real foundations of our ethical conceptions and subsequently worked on an evolution of the evolution of ethics. So he was arguing mutual aid is a basis, above that is justice and above that is morality. And each link up becomes a little bit weaker as a way up. It's now a mainstay of sociobiology with typical altruism. And as Chomsky said, it's like, you know, well the well, the stuff which is like nasty stuff, like, you know, that like, oh, we're all selfish bastards, we're all in it for ourselves, that gets stressed. The other side of it all, the cooperative side of it all, just gets um, you know, downplayed or ignored, even though that is just as strong um, in terms of evolutionary theory as um, the, the, the competi competi competitive side. And there was a really good programme um, a few years back about ants in the Jura in, in Switzerland and France. And basically, the reason why. I can maybe talk about this later, but it's really, remind me to talk about ants later because it's really interesting, but I'll get back to the talk. Uh, sorry, um, but do ask me about ants, it's a very interesting programme. Um, so 1905, the next big thing, the Russian Revolution. Welcomed it and um, walked with Russian anarchists. He thought about returning home and he actually went to the rifle range to practice his shooting skills in case he did go home and he had to go fight in the barricades. Um, so, gentle prince of non, gentle, gentle prince of nonviolence, um, at work there. So, while he was thinking that the revolution would essentially be just a republic, like a la 1789, um, he also argued that the working class had to raise its own demands, both the peasantry and the industrial workers in the cities. Basically, he had to fight for two things. He had to basically want to gain representative rule and now want to implement economic reforms. He, he's basically arguing that, well, we can't get an anarchist society. What we can do is um, stress working class demands, break the power, economic and political power of bourgeoisie. And so we'll be in a better position to achieve an anarchist revolution later, presumably with support of one from Western Europe. 
So it's all about weakening the economic and political power of the bourgeoisie. You had to fight both for, um, they basically said, the Liberals and the Social Democrats will fight for what they want, which is political change. The anarchist job is to fight for economic change, to raise the demands of economic expropriation, land to the peasants, workplaces, and factories to the workers. And, and he also argued that workers are cells of the future social society, the powerful means for preparation of a social revolution. He also noted that the, the Soviet, the Workers' Council, um, reminded them of the sort of the period of the French Revolution and so forth. So it should be pointed out that um, in 1905, during that time, the only people who were raising demands about economic change, economic the working class demands were the anarchists. The Social Democrats and the Liberals were basically viewing this is a bourgeois revolution, all we can do is basically get political reforms, um, but the anarchists were the ones arguing for, nope, we need to fight for class-based um, changes. This next major work is the Great French Revolution, 1909-1909, published simultaneously in French and English, and focused on the roads and the masses and the towns and the villages. And, it, and basically it was a popular movement, the key role of the peasants and the artisans in pushing the, the Jacobins um, further and further left to actually clear out feudalism and basically make a, make a proper revolution. Um, it's not a question of you know, risings, you know, revolts and so forth, it's whether there's new institutions being created as a result of a revolution. And he pointed to the sections in the districts um, created in Paris and elsewhere, and the village communes as a dual power, essentially, which, were, which was used to radicalise the revolution and push the Jacobins in Parliament further and further to the left and actually rip up, rip up feudalism, get rid of the monarchy, which they would never have done by themselves. They were more than happy to compromise with the aristocracy. But because the, the peasants and the artisans revolted, organised themselves and pushed and basically expropriated land and so forth, they made the revolution happen. And it's obviously more than just a history, it's about learning the lessons of past revolutions. He wasn't doing it because, well, he was interested in it, but it is basically a, this is what we did, in the, this is what was done in the past, this is what we can learn from and make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes as the previous revolution, which saw the Jacobins basically destroy the social revolution in favour of bourgeois institutions. His last book, Modern Science and Anarchy, basically is three parts, well four parts actually, but the first part is basically about the rise of anarchism and linking it to science and scientific method. So essentially um, the day job and his, um, and his politics merged into one there. The next part is on communism and anarchy, defending um, the the idea of liberty and communism, basically saying that we're not diminish individuality, in fact communism is required for true individuality to express itself and develop. And the third and fourth parts are about the state, its historic role in terms of um, you know, what classes it, it, it favoured, what, sort of, um, what it did in the past to crush popular institutions and communal institutions, and the current state as well. Um, its role, how it was structured and so forth, why it's structured that way, why um, we, have, we should have nothing to do with it and our aim would be to, to get rid of it. Um, and both are very important um, analyses. And instead of looking for the state and trying to influence the state by getting elected to it, he said, look to the workers, get the workers to build their own organisations, build their own unions, build their own federations. That's the only way you're going to get social change. Okay, um, I'm going to I'm not going to avoid it because you know, in 1914 when the First World War broke out, he supported the Allies there uh, against Germany and the Austro-Hungary Hungary in 1914. Um, as Erico Malatesta, the great French, the great Italian anarchist, said, a truly pathological case. He actually went. Nobody could believe he did it. He just basically went totally jingoistic and gung ho in favour of the Allies. Um, this, was, this came as a surprise and a shock to basically everybody because no, it, was, it was like completely against everything he'd ever written before and said before. Um, but um, didn't it completely come out of nowhere? He viewed France, he was very, had a very romantic idea of France. It was a home of revolution and so forth. And he was very concerned and had lots of his writings were very concerned about the threat Prussia um, and German militarism had in the home on France. And he thought that, that basically 
if Germany won, then the revolution and hopes for freedom would be destroyed completely. Um, right in 19, 1905, he thought that if the war did break out, there would be a revolution, and so you defend defend France and the revolution at the same time. That didn't happen in 1914, and he basically ended up supporting the French state. Um, he always had a favourable view of national liberation, um, and did not think a social question could be addressed under foreign, well under foreign rule. Again, that played its part. He also would have the fear of German militarism and authoritarianism. He thought that Germany, in fact, he thought that the Frank, Germany winning the Franco-Prussian War pushed back socialism um, in, in Europe by decades, and he thought another victory in 1914 would do the same. Um, but I should stress it was not a split in the movement. Basically, Kropotkin and about 20 other people supported him, and that was it. The vast bulk of the movement, except for in France, um, disagreed with him. And as Mao Testa said, not numerous, but unfortunately some of the most famous and we would love and remote, respect most. And he was completely wrong. And, and unsurprisingly enough, Anarchists in 1914 onwards published his own, arg his own, arg his own pamphlets and articles against him. Um, Emma Goldman in Mother Earth, um, she reprinted, um, she printed his letter supporting the Allies against Germany. Um, Alexander Bergman wrote a letter, and then she then they published um, his pamphlet Wars and Capitalism, and as the best reply we could give to his own argument. In Britain, they sold his pamphlet um, War and Capitalism <laughs> to, to refute his own position. Um, so, yes. So he was completely ostracised by the anarchist movement. Um, he he just basically he, he did keep in touch with Rudolf Rocker and sent him books when he was interned as an enemy alien. Um, so, um, but most people basically he was he was frozen out of freedom. Um, then um, the Thames Nouveau collapsed, and he basically lived in Brighton more or less alone. Um, however, the Russian Revolution broke out in 1917, February 1917, and he returned to Russia. Um, but unfortunately, continued to call for Russia to fight the Germans, and so was again completely marginalised out with um, the Russian liberals, who were quite happy to um, have him sort of witter on about the need to destroy the Germans. Um, anarchists in Russia completely ignored his 14, more or less completely ignored his position, and went back to what he was saying in 1905, advocated raising economic demands and struggles. And ironically enough, Kropotkin, Lenin took over Kropotkin's call for raising economic demands and disrupting the state from the 1905 revolution. And ironically enough, Kropotkin, um, in 1904, um, during the Japan-Russian war, basically took a neither sides approach, which Lenin didn't do. He supported Japan. And um, so, ironically enough, Lenin took over most of Kropotkin's positions in 1917 quite successfully. He was too old and frail to play an active role, retired to work on ethics, which came out after he died, but he also wrote critiques of events and met with visiting anarchists, and people like Emma Goldman and so forth. And to sum up his position um, in terms of the Russian Revolution, it was like, how not to introduce communism? And he basically said that um, high centralised power, bureaucratic, creating state capitalism, this is not how you create communism, this is how you basically put people off communism. And he always pointed out, it's like, this is a good quote, we have always pointed out the effects of Marxism in action. Why be surprised now? He said that to Emma Goldman. And, 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 and in the end, he was still pointing to the trade union movement, um, the syndicalist movement, as a means of um, social transformation. Even as one of his last letters is basically saying, um, you know, that is the way forward. Um, you know, sort of the syndicalist approach, which was raised by the, the, by Bakunin in the First International, and which he championed in the 1870s onwards, he was still advocating uh, in the last years of his life. Oh, wrong way. Konstrat Kropotkin died in March, on February, um, 8th of February 1921. Public funeral was agreed by Bolsheviks and turned into a mass process. It was basically the last public demonstration against the Bolsheviks um, until um, the Soviet Union collapsed. A few weeks later, strikes broke out all across Russia. All the major, all the industrial centres in, in Russia went on strike. It's a rolling wave of general strikes across the country. 
Petrograd, like other cities, was placed under a state, state siege. Um, but the sailors in the Konstrat naval base sent delegates to investigate what was going on in Petrograd. And they raised a resolution in support of the strikers and called for the promises of 1917, Soviet democracy, freedom of press for socialists and anarchists, um, assemb freedom of assembly, unions and so forth. The Bolsheviks responded by crushing it to maintain the dictatorship. And Kropotkin's warnings and state socialism were confirmed with beyond doubt. So conclusions. Um, you took a scientific approach to, to anarchism, basically um, looking at tendencies within modern day society which pointed towards something beyond it. Um, anarchism wouldn't, wouldn't be something that just popped out of the air, nowhere. There was actually trends within capitalism, um, whether it was like um, oppositional trends, like the workers' movement, or trends within the um, dynamics of the industrial process, um, the integration of um, the spread of industries to, to so-called backward nations and so forth. And he looked at those tendencies and built his arguments for anarchism based on examples which were actually happening in the here and now and extrapolating them forward. He had a realistic approach to revolution. He didn't think it would just happen overnight or come out of nowhere or that it would be a perfect world the next day. He recognised that it would be, um, you know, it would take time, it would be difficult. He was, he was an anarchist because he recognised a revolution would be difficult. Um, and that's one of the, you know, so, so that's important to stress. And he recognised it would take time. And he also recognised that um, it would not be immediately communist. The role of anarchists would be encouraging communist, libertarian communist tendencies, expropriation and so forth. And it would take time for, and after, even after successful revolution, it would still take time to sort of transform society from the legacy inherited from class society. He was a class warrior. Um, the notion that he believed in sort of class cooperation is just nonsense. You know, what solidarity can exist between the capitalist and the worker he exploits, between the army chief and the soldier and the soldier the governing and the governed. And he had a vision of a better world and how to achieve it. And it's all to do with the right of well-being. It wasn't just a case of you know, better, you know, better you know, more food or better food or better housing and so forth. It was about the whole individual as a producer and as a consumer, as a person. And it's all to do with well-being for all. Um, and his vision um, it sort of still inspires. So for the reading, <coughs> there is books. That's the list of all his books. Um, and selections and collections and so forth. And if you're looking for an excellent book, Caroline Cam's Peter Kropotkin, The Rise of Revolutionary Anarchism, um, is one I would recommend. It's an absolute stonker. And, um, and that's, if you're going to read one book about Kropotkin, um, that would be one I would recommend. So, um, yeah, that's it. Um, thanks very much. I hope you found that interesting.